Join me in this responsive greeting this morning. God who creates us reshapes us for a purpose. We come as clay in the potter's hand. Good morning and welcome to worship. It is a great day to come and gather and be the body of Christ alive in the world, gathering here in this space. This morning, we will be listening for a word of encouragement that inspires us to take the next step in what God is calling us to do. And so I invite you to listen for that which gives you courage, which fills your heart, that we might move our feet into what is next that God invites us towards. Today, leading us in worship today, Jim Bohm, Tom Lafferty, and later Ival Sawyer will be leading us in our singing and communion liturgy. And we, this is not Sue Keen, our liturgist. Mary Burpee is our liturgist today. Sue Keen is unwell, so she can't be with us. So we hold her in prayer and give thanks for Mary helping us to hear the word of God today. Again, worship is the work of all of our hearts raised before God. And so it is all of our work that we join in doing this morning. If you are interested in the other work that we do in the life of the church, there is an insert in your bulletin with ways in which we are continuing to be the body of Christ in the world. And so I invite you to see the insert for more information on things we can do apart from Sunday mornings. Today, I wanna to highlight that it is one of our special Sundays in the United Methodist Church. It is World Communion Sunday. And so on your way in, you might have received an envelope or a card. These are ways that you can give to support this special offering. The special offering today goes to support students from around the world as they study and answer God's call. And so it supports uh, scholarships, particularly for ethnic and, inter and international students. And so as those of us connected the body of Christ all throughout creation across the nations, we give this day in honor of that work. Following worship today, it is a full day today. Following worship, it is crop walk in our community. And so beginning at 1230 at Christ the King Lutheran Church, we will go and we will join for registration with the walk beginning at one. Later in service, there will be a time for those who are walking to be blessed or sent forth in that work. And there are ways you can continue to support them as well. A reminder that funding from Crop Walk goes uh, for hunger needs, particularly uh, in our community. 25% of all that is raised stays in our communities to support Community Kitchen and the feeding that it happens in that space. And we know that at Community Kitchen, it is more than hungry bodies that are fed. It is also hungry hearts that are nourished and having community together. So I invite you to give generously in the ways you can this day. But now let us listen for how God is calling us. How is God nudging us? Who are the people God is putting in our lives that we are called to love more fully right now? The invitation is to listen for God's promptings and find in this space courage to answer and take the next step. I invite you to worship in the way that is best for you. Let us pause, breathe in the Spirit's presence. We are in this space and God is all around us. I invite you to rise and body or spirit for our call to worship. Come worship God the potter in whose hands we are remade. We, we trust, trust in God, God and the, the goodness, goodness of our new creation. creation. Take heart for this shaping will require old ways to fall away. We will, we will be, be strong, strong and, and courageous. courageous. God, God, change our, our hearts. hearts. Be ready, for this shaping will give rise to new ways of being. We, we will, will not be afraid. afraid. God, God, change, change our, our lives. lives. Though we will face the unknown, the unfamiliar, and the uncomfortable, God, God will, will be, be with, with us. us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We will join now in our opening song, Speak, O Lord. It is found on the insert in your bulletin and on the screen.
us join in a spirit of prayer. Encouraging God, we hear your invitation into the future and we look to you for courage. Open us to know your presence as we embark together on new adventures. Calm our fears and animate our spirits for ongoing discovery. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning tells the prophet Jeremiah's call story. Jeremiah is afraid and has good reason to say no to the call. God reassures him so that Jeremiah can say yes. Hear this reading from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you into the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. These are holy words for all God's people. Thanks be to God. At this time, would the children come forward for their time together? Come on up. Oh, Elliot, are you going to be brave so your mama can come up too? <laughs> are you going to sit right there? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Good morning. You are Elliot. You know what, Elliot? I remember when you were born and when you were really little. And I will tell you, and you don't remember me because you don't remember those things when you're that little and that's okay. But I will tell you that when I was singing our first song and I just saw your family, I was almost crying because I have missed you all so much and it is good to see you. So, Sasha, do you remember Elliot? No, he would have been a little tiny, tiny baby. And then the pandemic happened. So, But I'm going to tell a story to you today. Are you ready for it? And we just heard it. Mary read it, but I'm going to read it to you in this Bible that we use. It's called Jeremiah the Boy Prophet. So, see the pictures? So we have... Someone making clay, making pots. That's why I have a pot up there. That's also why I have Play-Doh up there, because they create out of that. And so this is about Jeremiah. Jeremiah's a little boy right here. The story goes like this. One day, God spoke to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I have chosen you to be my prophet. That's someone who tells God's, God's words to people. Jeremiah was afraid. Uh, I am only a boy, he said. I won't know what to say. I will tell you the words, God said, touching Jeremiah's lips. Even before you were born, I chose you for this. God showed Jeremiah a branch of an almond tree, which is the first tree to bloom in the spring. And Jeremiah knew then what God meant, that he would make Jeremiah's work blossom like the almond tree. Then God sent Jeremiah to a potter's house. Jeremiah watched as the potter formed a jar of clay on his wheel. But the jar was lopsided. So the potter took wet clay and reshaped it until at last it was whole and perfect. My children are like clay in my hands, God said. If they let me, I will make them whole and perfect. Jeremiah served the Lord as a prophet for 40 years years as a long time and tried to teach people how to live and be shaped by god's love and the prayer down here is dear god thank you for giving purpose like something for us each to do 
to everyone's life, including mine. I have a question. Have you ever felt like you were too young to do something? Maybe said, I'm not big, or you felt like you were too small to do something? Yeah, what's something you've been too small or too young to do, Sasha? Yes, we went on a trip and there was a zip line and you were not old enough to do the zip line. Yeah, is there anything you feel too small to do? Uh huh. Yeah, because you were too little too. Yeah, for a zip line too. Yeah, it can be a scary thing, huh? Oh, that. Are you excited to grow so you can go on the big water slide? That's what I would be excited for. Yeah. There are some things that sometimes it makes sense that for safety reasons, we might be too small for things. But I love this story because God says, well, you're not too small for me. You're not too small for me to say you can still help other people. You can still show love and kindness. You're not too small for that. Who do you see out there? Can you find someone in your binoculars? Papa, okay, look at Papa right now. Okay, and now say, I'm not too young for love. That's a big thing to say. No, that's all right, but you can see him. Anyone you see out there, you're not too young or too little to be part of what God is doing in the world. You're a part of it. You don't have to wait to be bigger or older or stronger or wiser or any other, other thing. You're really, really strong already. So we're so much better because you're already strong and you can share that. I love that. What else are you really good at? At reading yourself some books. And you're really good at singing, huh? You were singing throughout the time. That's amazing. All these are great gifts. Are they not all great gifts, Body of Christ? They are. Sasha, what is something you, right now, seven-year-old you, are good at that you think is good for others. <laughs> what do you think? You need to think about it more. Are you kind? Yeah, you're pretty kind. You also like to sing, and you are very creative, which we could all use a little more creativity. What? Oh, yes, you can make exactly the sound of Ariel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yes. Do you want to, do you want to, no, not right now, maybe, maybe after, maybe afterwards. Well, will you say a prayer with me? Let's pray. And we pray in a couple ways. Sometimes we fold our hands like this. Sometimes we do this, which means we're open to God. But however we come to pray is fine. That's okay. Dear God, thank you that you give us things that are special that we can use to help show more love and kindness in the world, to make others brave and strong. We don't have to wait to be old enough or big enough. You use us just as we are. That is good. Amen. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna put these chairs back. We've got the nursery open and we'll have communion later today, okay? In an article in 1991, Marion Wright Edelman recalled hearing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak at Spelman College when she was a young lawyer. One of the things I liked about him was that he didn't pretend to be a great, powerful know-it-all. I remember, remember him discussing openly his gloom, depression, his fears, admitting that he didn't know what the next step was. He would then say, take the first step in faith. 
You don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. David White's poem, Start Close In, echoes this sentiment. Hear an excerpt from this poem. Start close in, don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in, the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. Start with your own question, give up on other people's questions, don't let them smother something simple. Start right now, take a small step you can call your own. May God give us the courage to take our own first steps. Alas, Sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I am too young. I am only a boy. As someone who first felt a call to ministry around the age of 12 or 13, I can tell you I relate to Jeremiah. He took the words right out of my mouth. Well, not exactly. I have never in my life said, alas, Sovereign Lord except for when reading the scripture, but I have said, whoa, God, what are you doing? The point is the same. I have re related to Jeremiah's concerns. Oh, no, I am too young for that, God. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. As I continued to wrestle with my call into ministry as a young person, I found Jeremiah's story so comforting. I loved having a story in our scriptures, and Jeremiah is not the only one. That reminded me that others have had the same objections, the same hesitations, the same fears that I had. I almost said had, but I'm just going to say that I have ongoing. And so as I struggled with my call, I would read the story again and again of that little boy prophet, Jeremiah, and say in my own words, alas, sovereign Lord. Some years later, after I had wrestled a bit more with this call, and I found myself in seminary, I learned about call stories, how like literature and different writings, there's a form to them. We think of poetry with its meter. We might think of letters with their form that they have and their greetings and their endings. Call stories are the same. In scripture, they have a form. They begin with an introduction and then God coming with a task, a call for someone. And then right smack in the middle, alas, sovereign Lord, or some other version of an objection. I, I can't do that. The beautiful thing about a call story is that it doesn't end with the objection. For the story to be complete, God gives a reassurance and a sign. When I learned that, I remember taking even greater comfort knowing that Jeremiah, who I had related to all those years, was never the outlier. He was never the exception. He was the rule. To object to hesitate, to have some fear that would stand in our way of answering God's call is part of the journey. Now you can take up with God on your own why that is part of the journey, but there's something beautiful in it being a shared experience. Not an outlier, not an exception, but the rule of it. So Jeremiah says, alas, sovereign Lord, and Janelle says, whoa, God. And Isaiah says, uh, have you heard me, God? Have you seen how I live? Even when the disciples are sent forth on their great commission, when Jesus, the resurrected Christ, returns to them, the story goes, the resurrected Christ comes. And there are some who worship, and there are some who doubt. 
Not just Thomas, mind you, but some who doubt. And yet at the end of the story, they are all sent forth anyways. To object, to hesitate, to otherwise disqualify ourselves from the task God has at hand is a part of our journey in faithfully answering it. There is something about our self-examination of what are the things that we think stand in the way. And maybe some of them really are real barriers that we are called to let fall to the side. The self-examination part is a part of our continued growth, our continued shaping in God's hand. We talked last week about how change involves letting go. As much as learning, change involves unlearning. Like that grain of wheat that falls from the stalk so that it can bear new life. There are things we are called to let go of that God can bear new life in us. We must let go of our objections. We must let go of our hesitations, move despite them. We must release the excuses we think disqualify ourselves. Have you ever had something, please tell me, it's not just me and Jeremiah. Do any of you ever relate where like, whoa, God, maybe you do say, alas, sovereign Lord. But do you have... Show of hands. All right, some of you have, so you have, you might even be replaying in your mind right now what those disqualifications are for you. Maybe they are ones that you claim for yourself. Maybe there's a message someone has told you again and again and again of who you are. That limits an understanding of who God is calling you to be. We are called to (laughs) name them, Name those objections, say them out loud, take them before God. The things we would disqualify ourselves for, age or race or gender or relationship status or education or training or experience, what resources we have, how we've always done things, how others have always lived and been, whatever our or 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 is that we can pull out of our back pocket before God to erect our force field to keep us from going past where God's calling us. When it comes to God's call and God's vision and God's hope for us, God's forming in our lives, none of those ors, none of those disqualifications, none of those excuses we have at the ready get the final say. We might wish they did, but they don't. Again and again and again, the story is met. God meets those objections, those fears, those hesitations, those really nice-sounding excuses. God meets them again and again and again with a reassurance, with a sign. The reassurance might often sound like a promise. Mind you, it might not be the promise we want it to be, but it is God's promise to us nonetheless. In Jeremiah's case, it was the promise that God would be with him. God didn't promise to make Jeremiah avoid the really challenging, hard parts of his call, but instead that God would be with him. When Jeremiah said, I don't have the words, God said, you do now, I will give them to you. They might not be the words you want, but I will give you the words for the moment. And then the sign. God goes and touches Jeremiah's lips. Here, now, this day, I have given you the words to speak. See, you have them in your mouth. Now, depending on how how vehemently opposed Jeremiah was to the call, The reassurance and the sign can either be really great news or really terrible news. It's great because it means he's not disqualified from the call. It's terrible because it means he is not disqualified from the call. He's not getting out of God's hope for him. We have a, you want a story about that, you take a look at the story of Jonah. 
Jonah thought he would run away a little bit from God and get out from it. Hey, that story got real messy first. There's something beautiful and challenging in the reassurance that God gives, that invites and says, I will be with you in the call, but I will not let you go from it. I don't know how Jeremiah experienced it. I can tell you how I experienced it. A little bit of both those things. Reassuring and at the same time like, oh, really? Uh. And yet in the end, Jeremiah goes and does the work that God has called him to. Jeremiah becomes a prophet who tears down and uproots and builds and plants and offers God's new covenant again and again to the people. He speaks God's judgment. He voices God's promise. And he gives us the image that we have been spending the last few weeks with of God the potter. We, the clay, shaped again and again in the potter's hand. Despite all of his objections, Jeremiah decides that he will be clay in the potter's hands. That he too will be molded and shaped and formed after God's vision. I am sure there is no way that Jeremiah could have foreseen all that would come for him. None of us can ever foresee that. I can tell you, looking back, um, since that first sense of calling at 12 or 13, I could never have foreseen how it would all unfold. And yet, as we are reminded, we are not called to foresee it all to be ready in every moment for all that will yet unfold. We are invited to be clay that will still be shaped to meet what comes next. God with us in it. As we heard in our contemporary reading before the poem about how Dr. King himself, for all of his prophetic work in the world, was very clear that he took just the next step even when he couldn't see the whole staircase. We are called to the first step, to the next step. I have to tell you that when I was young and I was first figuring out what this thing was that God was calling me to, before I would even call it a call, right? That language came later. When I was like, I don't know, maybe I think I want to be a pastor? One of the greatest mercies of my discovery time is that my pastor at the time, Pastor Mike, he hid from me the list of what it would take to answer the call. Some of you are nodding. You might be familiar. Or you know that there are steps in any process of becoming anything, right? And as good Methodists, we have a method for what it is to become an ordained pastor. Here it is. This is page one, page two, page three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you go as fast as you possibly can, seven years, if you speed run it and everything aligns perfectly. He hid the list from me. Instead, he met me with a listening ear, and he accompanied me on the next step. And then the next step after that first one. So much so that when someone finally did show me the list, I was like, what? I had no idea. But there was a beautiful gift and the way he simply journeyed with me, encouraged me into just the next step. And now here I am by the grace of God, and with thanks to many who have mentored and supported and accompanied me in the journey. Many beautiful people who have done that. And here I am all these years later, blessed to accompany others through this list, one next step at a time. 
blessed to accompany all God's people in answering the wide ways in which God calls, the many ways God calls in our lives to serve. A tremendous gift. I could not foresee the journey to this point. And I am glad I couldn't foresee the journey to this point. I cannot foresee what will come next. But I can, in prayer, invite God to still shape me, form me, ready me, encourage me for what comes next. I can continue to be clay in God's hand, molded and shaped, ready to take the next one step as it becomes available, as it illuminates itself in my path. Anyone who has young children in your life, you might be thinking of Frozen 2, just do the next right thing. The song from that movie. These past couple of weeks, I have invited us all to be prayerfully attentive to what it is that God is doing in our lives right now. What is God calling us into next? And this has been the hardest part of every time when I come up and share this message is because I believe that it can be wide and diverse and varied. So to speak about what it is for you is a challenge. Maybe it's a role, maybe it's a task, maybe it's saying yes to something that you have said no to before. Maybe it's a change in relationship. Maybe it's a showing up in a space that we have avoided or with people we have ignored. Maybe it's a path of forgiveness in troubled relationships. I don't know. It can be wide and varied and many things that God is inviting us into. But I've asked us over the last few weeks to be prayerfully attentive to what that might be. And today I'm curious about what it is that gives us the courage to take the next step. What gives us the courage to release our grip on all those disqualifiers that we have ready to go? All those beautiful, well-crafted excuses that we would rather hold on to. What gives us the courage to stay clay in the potter's hand? And it is about courage. There's an author, researcher, Brene Brown. She writes a lot about courage. And what she writes every time is a reminder that courage is a heart word. Its root in Latin, core, has to do with heart. Sometimes we think about courage as the grand heroics of the world around us. And I don't want to discount those, but courage has to do with heart. It has to do with wholehearted living, with loving living. That is what gives us the courage that propels us forward in answering God's call. Whenever we say yes to God, whenever we take the next step, though it is uncomfortable or unfamiliar or challenging for us or invites us to grow, it always is a courageous act. It takes courage, but I also think it gives us courage because I think it pieces us back together into wholeness. When we grow in the image of who God has for us, we are brought back together. And so, my friends, beloved in Christ, it might not always feel heroic. Sometimes it might just feel small. But it always takes courage to say yes to the next step the first step. And on this World Communion Sunday, I am reflecting on how we have for us a reassurance and a sign that our objections, our fears, our hesitations don't get the last word. And some of us might hear Jeremiah's story and we might say, but when has God ever touched my lips and put the words in my mouth. We might not experience and encounter God in the way the prophets foretell. But all of us have this gift. 
Communion is itself, this holy meal is a reassurance to us of God's grace. It is a sign to us that no matter what the journey holds, here is grace enough for the next step. Here is love wide enough, welcoming enough to hold us whatever comes. To guide our feet to open our hands, to put our hearts back together. That is the gift of this table, this meal. And on World Communion Sunday, we remember that we celebrate it across the nations. All people of God who long to know God are welcomed at the same table. Wherever it is they live, Whatever their objections and hesitations and disqualifications are, and whatever language they say, alas, sovereign Lord, the same reassurance, the same gift, the same sign for each and every one of us. My friends, beloved church, my hope... My hope is that though we do not know the whole journey yet to come, my hope is that this day we will come to this table with hands open, open to release the things we would cling to that keep us fixed or unwilling to take the next step. Release those things, but come with hands open to receive the reassurance and the sign that God is with us in the next step. In the hope that that is and always will be enough to hold us. My prayer is that this table becomes for us a source of our courage. To say yes to what God is calling us to next. Just one small step at a time. May it be so for us to stay in always. Amen. Our hymn of response has changed my heart, O oh God. It has been our theme song of this series. Last week I told you we could sing it. We sing it through and we repeat it. And I'm challenging you to try again this week. The second time we repeat it through, instead of change my heart, let's try change my life. I forgot to change the words, so you're going to have to do the mental leap, but we'll do our best. Let's try as and rise as we are able and sing.
Amen. You may be seated. When we come to this table, we are receiving the sign of God's grace, the sign of God's love that will not let any barrier, any excuse, any disqualification, any fear stand in the way. This is grace that works its way into us. And it is our hope that we come as people willing to let God's grace work its way into us. And so we come as people, it is our practice that we come in a prayer of confession, trusting that grace will meet us on the other side of it. But in our confession, we seek to lay down before God those things that have been barriers to grace working more fully in us. Because we long to be people of changed hearts and changed lives in the world. So let us join in a spirit of prayer. God of next steps, when we just can't muster our courage and shut ourselves off from those who encourage us, forgive us and remind us that we are forgiven. Bring us back into the fold of care, especially on this World Communion Sunday. Remind us how expansive the fold of care is in your body alive in the world. When we choose comfort over needed confrontation that could move the world closer to justice, forgive us and remind us that we are forgiven. When we cannot see beyond the things we think disqualify us or the things that we are certain disqualify someone else for your service, surround us in grace. Open us to see anew. Give us the words to speak. Break down the barriers that lead us further into the hope that keep us from going further into the hope you have in mind. Break those barriers down and invite us into the hope of your new creation. Even when we think that we are fully formed and have no more need of any new creating, thank you very much. Still, Lord God, be at work within us. When we stand in the way of others' forward motion and forget to be the encouragers you would have us be, forgive us and remind us we are forgiven. Encourage us and make us to encourage others. Receive the silent confessions of our hearts, all those things that cling to us, alas, Sovereign Lord. Forgive us and remind us that we are forgiven. Amen. Siblings in Christ, beloved church, hear the good news. Our objections, our disqualifications, our excuses, our fears, they never get the final say in God's kingdom vision. So, my friends, grace works its way into us. God's reassurance and God's sign are before us. God the potter reshapes us and makes us whole. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Glory to God. God. Amen. As forgiven and reconciled people, I invite you to take a moment to those nearest you and extend a sign of peace and grace. The peace of Christ be with you. We continue in prayer. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right, a good, a joyful thing, always, everywhere, to give thanks to you, creating God, worker of holy clay. You molded us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. You fired us with your love and your passion. When we forgot to return to you time and again for the fresh reworking of our lives, you showed up for us. You soothed our cracked and drying veneer. You delivered us from the captivity of stagnation. You made a covenant to be present in this ever-changing journey and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. when you would save your people. He brought new sustenance to the lives of those who suffered from illness and hunger and separation. Through his own transformation, through baptismal waters, deep connections with the people, suffering for the sake of the least, and resurrection from death to hope, you gave birth to your church. You invited us to radical, transformational change and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, through every obstacle, through every pathway, in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you for it, he broke it, shared it with those who were with him, and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of the supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and he poured it out and gave it to those with him saying, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many in the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so it is that in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen.
Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here this day. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us vessels of Christ, that we may be for the world a vessel of Christ's own love. By your spirit, change us for the better. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the wide world around us until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Let us share in the prayer Christ taught us to pray, in whatever words, language we know it best. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread of life, broken that we might be made whole. The cup of love, salvation, forgiveness poured out that it might work its way into us and remake us from the inside out. Friends, in our tradition, it is Christ's table, and so all are welcomed at Christ's table. Any who longs to come is invited to receive. I would invite those who are helping to serve communion to come forward. And let us remain in prayer until we come and receive this meal. There will be two stations. On either side, you'll receive a piece of bread and a cup.
Let us pray. Thank you, dear God, that your reassurance is stronger than every alas, sovereign Lord that we name before you. That every hurt we bear cannot withstand your grace and love. Thank you for this holy meal, which reminds us of that again. Amen. My friends, before we receive the gifts we offer this day, every time I stand and I remind us that the way in which we live our lives apart from this place, day in, day out, this is a reminder of how it is that we too give our gifts back before God, that they go far beyond what is offered in an offering plate. And this morning, there is a beautiful witness of that that I'd love our whole congregation to share in. And so I'm going to invite Dick Walker and Deb Haynes up. And we are going to bless them. But Deb made this beautiful quilt for Dick. Dick has been in our prayers as he has struggled long days. And so Deb made this beautiful quilt and she offered it to him this morning. And I wanted you all to see it, but I also wanted you to be part of the blessing. And so it is beautiful. But when we talk about the ways we give our gifts in whatever way we are gifted to do so, beautiful example of that. But will you join me congregation? Let us offer prayers, laying hands, extend a hand towards Deb, towards Dick. Oh, it has a, it reads, I have not seen this. Let me, a quilt for comfort on your journey, filled with prayers for peace and healing for Richard from Deb Haynes, October 1st covering the world in love, one quilt at a time. My friends, keep your hands extended. Let us pray. Holy, gracious God, you give so many gifts to us in this world. Gifts of time and talents, gifts of creativity and beauty and wonder. And we give thanks for the way in which we can share those and give those back to the world. We give thanks for Deb and this quilt that she has created for peace and healing. We give thanks that it is a witness that we are all invited into that we can be people who bring peace and healing wherever we are to. We continue to surround Dick with our prayers, with your presence, and the same hope of healing in your kingdom's vision. And that in every step of the journey, he would be surrounded by love, peace, and your presence. Amen. Every day is a good day. And every day I know that I'm being prayed for, held up in love, and supported by this community. It's just overwhelming, and it's the most wonderful thing Every day is a good day, and, and with, with, with this community and this love, I, it's, uh, it's helping me along in this journey, and I'm learning more and more about what it's like to be healed. So, God bless everybody. God bless you. <laughs> yes. Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat, Dick and his beautiful prayer shawl. Yvette, do you want to say a word about crop walk? For those who can't hear online. Oh, sorry. Um, Idol and Tom are walking today for our church. If you haven't given a donation yet and you would like to, you can still do it online or I'll be out in the lobby. Hounding people, I guess, is what I could say about giving to crop walk. So your, every, your money is helpful, as you know, for Community Kitchen and for all the other programs that Church World Service is involved in. 
And there is a uh, the youth in our community. We're sharing and partnering with Christ the King Lutheran Church, other churches as well in this partnership. The youth will be having a scavenger hunt. So there are others who are walking. I, and Aram might be walking as well. I'm not sure, but letting you know that. But now, my friends, we have seen the witness of it. And so again, the invitation, let us give and live generously this day and always. I invite our ushers to come forward. God, we give thanks to you for all the ways in which you have lended us your strength and given us your courage and guided us into next steps that bring healing and wholeness and hope to our lives and to the lives of those in our community. Let these gifts we give this day go with your blessing and your spirit's power that they would witness to your hope throughout creation. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Continue in a spirit of prayer. We receive these, the, these prayers of our community on this day. Jess Jarris raises up prayers for her friend Beverly who had surgery for a fractured hip. We pray for her recovery, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those in our congregation and community who are experiencing dementia or cancer. Lord, in your mercy. Chris Horner invites prayers for David who had a heart transplant this week. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, we invite prayer for Deb Haynes, who we also just gave thanks for her gift. She's having surgery to dilate her trachea Wednesday, and we pray for a smooth uh, procedure and that it would accomplish its hope. Lord, in your mercy. We continue to hold in prayer Lynn Reynolds and her time in the hospital and the next steps that a place would be found for she, where she can receive care next. Lord, in your mercy. 
Vic Yost is also in the hospital and will be transitioning uh, to rehabilitative care. And so he had surgery this past week. So we pray for his recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Two joys to end our time. One is a preview of a birthday coming up this week. We celebrate with Steve. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pat Fisher offer thanks and joy for a great crew and successful reopening of Community Kitchen this past week. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayer. God, we ask you to have your way in our lives. And we enter this prayer time singing how we are yielded and still. Lord, you know that there are times when we are anything but yielding. And so we give thanks for your grace, which is even more unyielding still. Let it work in us to bring forth your spirit's gifts and the fruit of spirit in our lives, that it would change lives and hearts. Lord, this day we pray for your grace to be unyielding throughout the whole of creation. We remember that around the nations are those who are facing floods or fire, unseasonable weather, of all kinds, famine, war, threat of violence, the very real scarcity of not enough, though there is enough. We just have not found the creativity and energy to share it. Lord, let your grace be unyielding to shape the whole of creation after your kingdom vision. Let your grace be unyielding in our nation in our communities. Though there are divides that seem persistent, every day seeming to grow stronger, let your grace be more powerful still. Let the hope of love and action that binds us as a body of Christ lead us in the ways in which we interact with one another the ways in which we listen, the ways in which we question, the ways in which we challenge, the ways in which we grow, the ways in which we forgive one another. Let your grace be unyielding in our own homes, in this congregation, in our own hearts and lives. There are so many names this day that we have raised before you for prayer and care. We trust the wideness of your mercy and the strength of your power and the vision of your kingdom's healing that is at work, ever shaping, ever restoring, ever renewing us. Let that begin in our own lives. Change our hearts, O God, change our lives, O God, that we would be more and more like you. Let this be the place where your kingdom comes. That was Christ's hope. That's how Christ lived his life, a place where the kingdom comes. And so we offer our lives to you for the same purpose. And we give thanks that there is nothing that will stand in the way of you accomplishing that purpose in us. May it be so. Amen.
Let us join in our closing song again, another insert, Christ has broken down the wall. Let us rise and body our spirit to sing. Friends, amen. What kind of sending forth do we need but that song to remind us Christ has broken down the walls that would keep us from grace. And God is yet shaping us as those who will tear down every wall that keeps anyone else from God's grace and fullness too. Let us go this day knowing that that is true. Let us go in peace and stay courageous. Amen.